When it comes to going faster on the bike, you might be looking for things that you can copy off of the pros. Chances are though, you've overlooked this one, and it's potentially made a bigger difference to some pros performances than literally anything else. Forget wax chains, forget disc brakes, forget aero. Today, we're talking about proper hydration. Now, stay with me. I know it's not the most glamorous topic, but it's wild to think that this fairly obvious area has been all but completely overlooked by even the pro peloton for years. Well, today it's overlooked no longer because with the help of two Tour de France stage winners, a heat chamber, and some sodium obsessed hydration nerds, we're gonna find out how much difference hydration can actually make to your performance. We're also gonna find out why I'm not pro, again, and whether the answer to unlocking our full potential on the bike has been staring us in the face all along. I think in recent years, hydration has been overlooked in favour of fueling. There's been a massive push in the world of professional sports cycling in particular to look at how many grams of carbohydrate are you getting per hour. Yeah. And that's a critical part of your performance. But there are what we call like three levers to your nutrition performance. You've got carbohydrates, but you've also got fluids and electrolytes as well for the hydration side. So I think that's probably the reason why it's not in the headlines so much at the moment. But hydration has always been critical in it remains critical today and obviously the grand tours the tour de france is getting hotter every year the pros are seemingly getting faster every year pushing the limits more and more how important is it to amateurs living here in the uk it's not 40 degrees let's face it <laughs> is it still important that i hydrate yeah absolutely although it's in proportion to your the amount of sweat and, and electrolyte that you're losing so yeah Victor Campanaz, who we've been talking to today, you know, in in a massive stage of the Tour de France when he's working as hard as he can on a mountain top finish, he's going to sweat and need to drink twice as much as a regular rider. But there are some cases where, you know, amateur athletes who work really hard also have high sweat rates. Mm -hmm. If you've got a lot of layers of clothing on, you know, you need to be aware of your individual needs and losses. They're not, in general, always likely to be as high as professionals at the top of their game on the hottest days, but they're not inconsequential. So it's about understanding your body, really. Most of us can bluff it if we're out for two, three hours, if it's cool, you know, it's a very, very different game if it's, if it's full on race pace for three, four hours in the heat. So we often see that with, um, you know, especially with old school cyclists, they, they think, oh yeah, no, I, I don't want to carry the weight, I only got, or I only take one small bottle, and they, they muscle through, and they almost get used to kind of that, the accepting a level of degradation of the performance which they think is normal. Andy was keen to get across that simply drinking more is not the answer to all of our hydration woes. In fact, take on more sodium than your body needs, and you could see some quite catastrophic results. Too much sodium could see you gain weight due to water retention, see an increase in your blood pressure, an elevated core body temperature and hence accelerated fatigue, and that's before we could even get into what it could do to your bowels. There's plenty of stories out there about that. For this reason, the vast majority of hydration products are on the side of caution. Sweat is not created equal though. My sweat is different to Andy's sweat. That's different to Jan Bacalance's sweat, and all of them are probably different to your sweat. What we need then is a test to determine how much sodium and electrolytes are in said sweat. And luckily, I'm in the right place to find out how salty I am. Cool, so I need this arm. Yeah. This is the sweat inducer. There's two main steps to the test. So first part is attaching the sweat inducer to your arm. The inducer runs nine volts through your arm. It pushes that pilocarpine into your cells in your arm, yeah. tricks them into basically thinking that you're sweating maximally, exercising maximally, and start sweating. So okay. like a positive and a negative, it will just be under that red one. It will make, make you start sweating for 20 minutes, 20, 25 minutes in just that one spot in your arm. Mm -hmm. I'll just start that. So you might feel a little tingling under the red one. Okay. Some people feel more than others, some people feel nothing. <laughs> and then what we do after that is put one of these little macroducts on. So I'll just show you. So this bit, five, ten minutes. We've got a little macroduct there. So if you're sweating under just that bit, we put yeah. this little collector on. It's got a tube in it and a bit of blue dye in the back. So as you just start sweating in that one spot, it works like a vacuum. It gets pulled up into that tube, turns blue 
Okay. Fills up enough of that for us to run it through the analyzer over there. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, what we're measuring is how much sodium you lose in your sweat. So yep. not the quantity of sweat that will come later okay. in the lab. This is just the concentration of your sweat. All right, and this varies from person to from person. From person to person, yes. Yeah. Very much genetically determined. Mm -hmm. Do you think you're a salty sweater? It's a tricky question. It, it, it tastes quite salty when okay. it comes out my helmet. Yeah, so. that's one of the signs. <laughs> Other signs would be like marks on your kit after a session, mm -hmm. seeing in the eyes. Dogs I'm gonna, might I'm love you. I'm going to go with average. Average, I okay. Average. It started tingling, so I guess I'm sweating. Who knows? Well, the results are in, and it turns out that I am pretty salty. More salty than average, in fact, which might explain why I sometimes struggle at the end of hot rides, even when I think I've fueled properly. Now, I'm sure you want to know how Campanarts and Bacalants stack up. Well, they have sweat sodium concentrations of 957 and 1044 milligrams per litre, respectively. You might therefore be thinking that if you train, maybe you can somehow force your body to keep hold of its sodium. Unfortunately not. As Emily alluded to earlier, the salt content of your sweat is almost completely hereditary. And over the last 10 years of testing, the pros values have fluctuated by less than 10%. It looks then like I'm stuck with my salty sweat. But what does that actually mean for my riding? Well, first, we have to calculate how much I actually sweat. It's time to crank up the temperature. So this is the torture chamber, sorry, heat chamber. Um, it's currently at 40 degrees, 70% humidity, and my God. And so they were telling us that not all heat is created equal, and some of the Tour de France stages, for example, are a lot easier than 2016 Olympics, wherever that was. That was apparently really humid, and that made it so much harder. And my God, we started off 40 degrees, 40% humidity, absolutely fine like pedaling along at about 60% of FTP and yeah, it felt fine. And then the humidity ramped up 70% and just start bucketing sweat. And they were trying to hold us at like the same heart rate throughout and the power, my power just dropped off at an absolute cliff. So next job is to go and weigh myself. And then with the sweat test that we did earlier, they're gonna be able to tell me how many electrolytes I'm losing during exercise and therefore how much I need to drink to replace that. Um, as we've discussed with Jan and uh, Victor Campanarts is here as well and they've been saying that this isn't a percentage gain that being properly hydrated can give you, it is the difference between making it to the finish of a race or not and it's not just pros that need to be hydrated obviously so let's go and get weighed and uh, yeah, find out the damage. In the Tour de France, in cycling in general, there's obviously this culture of marginal gains. Is hydration a marginal gain? I don't believe so. I think, you know, we spoke to Jan Bacalance earlier who found out that in his career he couldn't perform in the heat for many, many years. Mm. He got sweat tested, he understood his sodium losses, he started to correct for that and he described it as binary, you know, he, it unlocked his performance, it was a zero or one proposition and I think what that means really for, the, for most people to, 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 to make it understandable is you, know, you have a level of performance that you can unlock which is based on your fitness and we call that you know, 100%, if you can go to 100% of what you can do, if you don't hydrate and get that proper, you're going to be down below that. You may be at 80%, if you're not yeah. quite right, you might be 50%, but you're, you're gonna fail to meet that. It's not like you're gonna go to suddenly to 103% or 110%. Anything that takes you there is usually banned and illegal. You know? yeah. <laughs> but, but getting your hydration, getting your fueling right, it enables you to express your maximum athletic potential. And if you can do that consistently, then as a professional, that's now a necessity. As an amateur, that means you're gonna beat most of your rivals most of the time. Okay, so weighing complete, and the clever guys and girls here have calculated that in the heat chamber, I was losing sweat at a rate of a whopping 2.03 kilograms per hour. Now, just to put that into context, that's around 2.7% of my body weight each hour. 
Now, admittedly, I won't always be sweating as profusely as I was in there. But if I was, then I'd be in serious trouble in less than an hour. Whilst not even pushing that hard, I've done some research and at 1% dehydration, so after about 20 minutes in the heat chamber, my core body temperature will already be elevated. That means that I'm fatiguing quicker than I otherwise would. At 2% dehydration, so after around 45 minutes, I'm going to see a drastic reduction in my already questionable athletic performance. And this is what Bacalance and Campanarts were saying, that unless you're Pagatcha, you can't afford to lose that performance. That means that you're getting dropped. Keep going, and at 5%, I'm approaching heat exhaustion. 7% I'll probably start hallucinating, and at 10% things are looking particularly unrosy with something called circulatory collapse. So, what can I do about it? Well, now that I know my sweat rate and my sweat saltiness, I can of course work out how much I need to replace. The experts here reckon that if I was to ride stage 18 of this year's Tour de France, that's the one that Campanarts won, then I'd need to be consuming about 1,000 milligrams of sodium for every litre of fluid lost, and that I need to be drinking at least one bottle an hour. Before doing this testing, I must admit I would have probably just focused on my carb intake on a long ride, and realistically that means that I'd be getting less than half the sodium that I need to perform at my best. Now, you might not need the same amount of sodium as I do, but I think that the vast majority of riders aren't getting enough, and therefore riding at less than 100% of their ability. Let us know in the comments section below whether you think you're a salty sweater and what you do to stay hydrated on the bike. As always, if you enjoyed this video, then please give it a like, subscribe to the channel for lots more cycling stuff, and we'll see you next time.